pterodactyl and the dinosaurs. Otherwise known as Ernie Blimp and the Blimpsouls, or as they're better known today, Brett Marvin and the Thunderbolts. Seaside Shuffle has been their only hit record. The group have had no other success in their 13 year existence. But still they struggle on week after week, playing like so many other small bands do in pubs. Of course, they're hoping to make the big time once again, but Keith, the percussionist, recalls how difficult it was the first time. I can remember that we took a tape round uh, about a year before Seaside Shuffle was number two. Nobody was interested, you know? Lots of managers. Uh, we played it to them, they said, well, it's all right, but, you know, we can't release it. Then about a year later, Jonathan King re-released it, and it was a hit. And those same managers were on the doorstep at a pub gig we did in London, Fulham, to sort of try and sign us up. That was really top agencies like Man, all that, you know. Yeah. And we were just doing a pub, and at the same time, in that pub, we were on telly, top of the pops. John, who's the drummer and washboard player with the group, has never forgotten that particular show. I remember I told me mum, and uh, the morning, like the Wednesday morning before I went up to record it, I washed my hair, and she got all this conditioner stuff out of you. And so my, my mum didn't really care what I looked like before that. And <laughs> then she was there with all this conditioner, you know, put it on your hair and all that. So anyway, we go, uh, because it was um, a summer record, we were all sort of summer gear, you know. And so uh, we went out and we got all this sort of rubber seagulls and stuff, you know. And we turned up the studio and we also had some plastic mats because of the British web. And, uh, and they liked it, the blokes at the BBC. And so the week after, they arranged for all these uh, gorgeous girls to turn up, you know. And by that time, we'd gone like the whole hog and we had uh, Southwesters and all that. You know? <laughs> so we weren't doing summary stuff, they were doing summary stuff. And so we turned up with all these sort of Southwesters and raincoats and stuff. And there's all these uh, beautiful girls walking up and down with uh, bikinis on behind us. You know? Some big life on the beach, there is a man to tell that thing. Way over there, kids throw pebbles in the sea. Where we swim amongst a lot of pretty companies. The record was in the charts for about a month, a commercial success in fact. On the proceeds they bought new equipment which they still rely on today. But the success was short-lived. The guitarist Graham had hopes of remaining professional, but it didn't quite work out like that. I went back to college, when, um, about 75, when we couldn't make a living at it anymore. I just thought I would have to learn to do something else, and I couldn't do anything else. So, I went to college. To learn what? To learn furniture design. How do you feel about playing in pubs three or four times a week for five pounds a night? Um, I just like playing and it's good to have somewhere to play. And that's why we just play pubs and maybe the same pub every week. Do you have people from record companies coming down to see you a lot? No. <laughs> Not very often. Supposing I said to you, well, I'm sorry, but nothing's going to happen for at least another ten years. What would you yeah, do? Well, would, you carry on? <laughs> would you carry on playing in pubs? Or yeah, I think we'd be going on there. 65 would probably still be in pubs, or not in pubs necessarily, but still be playing somewhere, I think. I don't think you, you stop playing. I, I don't think we could give it up and just get a butcher's shop or a minicab business or anything like that. I think we still keep playing. But not all members of the group have the same determination. Taffy, the pianist, joined after that one hit record, so he's only played the pubs and the occasional small dance hall. Does he always enjoy it? I can't honestly say that, no, because there are some nights, I mean, if you're doing a job during the day and you've got the third gig in a week and you you are very tired by then, I think, you know, there are gigs where we, we all feel different times that we don't feel like doing much. But then again, when you start playing, it all kind of... There's some sort of... some strange thing that we... that we are all together after all this time. And I think it must be something to do with just playing. You know. It's not that each one of you is a bit frightened of, of going out on your own. You'd rather stick together and die as one entity or I succeed think so. <laughs> as one entity. I think there's a lot to do with it. Originally, of course, when you started, there was a, a strong rhythm and blues audience around. You know? Yeah. If you carry on like you are now, you'll be catching the next generation. Yeah, I think we've still got the old generation as well. <laughs> but. Uh, it's this the thing about being classed as just a kind of pub band, you know, to play around for fun. I mean, that's a lot to do with it, you know. But I think, I think we've got more serious intentions as well. What, commercially, you mean? Yeah, commercially. But when? <laughs> Soon. I think in the next six months a year, it's got to be either the next step or we might not carry on playing so regularly.
So we did say that two years ago as well. I was going to say, you've been together 13 <laughs> years. Perhaps you might be together for another 13 years. I'm sure we will in one way or another, yeah. How old are you now? Uh, 32. Could I be 26? <laughs> stage, the band certainly aren't short of energy. Keith, the percussionist, spends his time running around, jumping on boxes, changing his clothes, and attacking strange lumps of household furniture. Well, that's the uh, kitchen sink. Which you I play a kitchen sink? Yeah, uh, hit occasionally, yeah. And uh, electric ironing board. Um, what, do you mean the ironing board is electrified? That's right, yeah. Special mics on it, something I invented. Because, really, when you think of it, you get bass, drums, guitar, uh, recognised. Uh, line up, but why should you? You know, you can do other things. I mean, for instance, now we're trying two bases up and uh, we've got a washboard. We haven't got a proper drummer, we've got two percussionists. I notice you have a, yes, you have a boot yeah. with a, uh, some yeah. sort of pole on it. Um, can you describe that? Yeah, well, it's an old Aborigine instrument in origin. They used to have them with shells on, but mine is uh, beer bottle tops nailed onto a broomstick, big boot on it, and a spring at the bottom. And just percussion, really. I mean, just uh, a visual. It's very visual. I mean, it looks good. Um, but it sounds good as well to record it's all right. You, know. you have a special name for this, yes? Yeah, Basically. well, I mean, the Aborigine is, or Australia, is called a lager phone, but mine is Zob, Z-O-B, Zob stick. An old nautical term, I think. <laughs> Now we know what a zob stick sounds like. I wonder what they did with that in the Navy. There's an old showbiz saying which goes, don't give up your day job. Well, the Thunderbolts have certainly followed that advice. If they hadn't, they'd all be broke by now. On a good night, they might make ten pounds each. And sometimes they even play for nothing, ending up out of pocket after paying for the petrol and the mandatory glasses of beer. So they've all kept their daytime occupations. Two of them are art teachers. One's a mature student, John the drummer is an electronics engineer about to be made redundant in a week's time and another member is a picture framer. He's the only one in fact who admits to very little musical ability and his name is Lockie. On the road, amongst other things, repair the van, look after the equipment, set it up at gigs, make sure they get there on time. Everything, you name it, I'll do it. So you're the manager and the road <laughs> Yeah, manager. it's all that, all the bookings. Handle the money? Yeah, handle, oh, I have to handle the money. Musicians can't handle money. <laughs> that's true, they spend it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's about it, really. So when they've finished, you have to pack up all the gear? Yeah, the pump it all out the van, pack it all away, but the next night, I've done that thousands of times. What keeps you going with the band? Because there's all, it obviously isn't the sort of vast um, monetary rewards. No, no. I mean, I believe in these blokes. I mean, I think that they're some of the best musicians we got going around here, you know what I mean? You, you obviously get bands, I hear bands on the radio and on the telly and all that, which are better, better produced. Because <laughs> we haven't got the, you know, I mean, that's where they, that's, I think that's where it all comes down to it. I mean, money, really. I mean, we, we get by on a shoestring. So we don't have time to get big rehearsal studios and all rehearsals and things like that. So we, when a number, we work out a new number, it's done in somebody's front room, you know. You know, and our equipment's old. I mean, we used to do a lot of colleges and we used to add more PA in, but we've had to sell our bits of PA to keep it all going. You know. But as it goes, I think we get by, I think we get a reasonable sound. You've heard it. The point is, I mean, if I wasn't doing it, I'm, I'm happy doing this. I'm a nice bloke to live with because I'm doing this. If I wasn't doing this, I might be like a bear with a sore head. You know. Do you have any influence on the music they play? Yeah, a bit, yeah. I tell them uh, the number's not working. You know, I say, it's a terrible number there. You know, it's not, not coming off. Then they come back and they rehearse it a bit more. Because, I mean, one of the problems is I don't play an instrument, so I can't sort of say uh, that's wrong because so-and-so was playing in the wrong key, or I can hear sometimes with every wrong key, you know, but I mean, I can't say that doesn't work, it needs a bit of bass in here, or it needs a bit of that, because I don't know. Do you think if they got very successful, they might think twice about having you along? And well, I'm not the best sound engineer, I'm not really a proper sound engineer, or electronics wizard or anything like that. So obviously if they started making money and getting off then they'd have to get other guys to do that. 
but I would be there and I, mean, I hope that I would be sort of in charge of everything. I mean, I could say that I've heard them more than anybody else in the world. Which is true. So what chance does the group have of hitting the big time once again? I mean, playing the sort of blues and rock and roll that they do of the 60s. Paul Lowsby, as one of the top concert promoters in the country, is someone who could give them a break. Now, Paul, you, you've heard the band. Now, would you, would you book them? No. You don't see them playing headline at the Wembley Empire, Paul? Never. One time, this band sold many thousands of copies of a record called Seaside Shuffle. Why shouldn't they do it again? Because, unfortunately, the biggest downfall, as I could see, was when they were playing Terry Dattel and the Dinosaur. It's probably destroyed their career. But whose fault is that? It's the marketing process of what record companies are all about. Because they get on a sequence, they sold a record on a one-off situation, and unfortunately, the band who had a permanent, a permanent existence ended up with no existence at all. In terms of career progress, you might as well forget it. Well, I don't think the band would agree with you because they're after a career, after all. If I was honest and said that if you could get a whole bundle of A&R men down here, the artists and repertoire network of the, the record companies, that they're the people who, at the end of the day, will sign the bands to the labels, fly them full of drinks and make them realise that people enjoy it. That profile of Brett Marvin and the Thunderbolts was presented by Pete Drummond, produced by Paul Gibbs, and researched by Mary Roberts.